Hey YouTube, it's Carrie, and I'm back with another video. Um, what you'll actually be seeing right now is little clips of me as I'm reading my books for the month of February. Because when I did the video for January, I read 23 books, and it sounds like that's kind of going to be the norm for me <laughs> for this year. And I was getting very mixed up and confused and trying to remember what each of the books was about and I think this format is going to be better for the number of books that I consume in a month. I'm going to try to do little mini reviews as I finish them. So today's the 5th of February and so far I've read three books and I'm about two and a half hours away from finishing a fourth. So I'm just going to go ahead and review the three that I've read so far. And then when the month is over, I'll compile all these little clips into one nice video for you guys. So the first book that I read in February is called The Queen's Poisoner. I'm leaving space over here so I can put the image over there. Um, this is the first book in the King Fountain series, and it's written by Jeff Wheeler. Um, let me just read the synopsis for you because, as we learned last month, I suck at trying to describe books even when I just read them. Um, King Severn Argentine's fearsome reputation precedes him, usurper of the throne, killer of rightful heirs, ruthless punisher of traitors. Attempting to depose him, the Duke of Kiskadden gambles and loses. Now the Duke must atone by handing over his son Owen as the king's hostage. So our main character in the book is Owen. Um, and should his loyalty falter again, the Duke's, the boy will pay with his life. So our main character is a hostage in somebody else's court, and he's got the threat of his family's deaths hanging over his head the whole time. Um, seeking allies and eluding Severn spies, Owen learns to survive in the court of King Fountain. But when new evidence of his father's betrayal threatens to seal his fate, Owen must win the vengeful king's favor by proving his worth through extraordinary means. And only one person can aid his desperate cause, a mysterious woman dwelling in secrecy who truly wields power over life, death, and destiny. And the woman that ends up helping Owen is the Queen's Poisoner. That's where the title of the book comes from. So it is not the main character, it's a helpful side character. Um, I really did enjoy this book. I'm going to open up my review of it because I put more information in my review as to my thoughts immediately after reading it. <laughs> um, this, this book is definitely pushed forward by characters and setting. We don't actually get a ton of dialogue from our main character. He's a shy eight-year-old boy. He is very young to have to be a main character of this book. I found that a little interesting. You know, you don't normally see a narrator that young or a protagonist that young. Um, he's thrown into this mess of court intrigue and manipulation that is far away from his home. But we do get plenty of dialogue from everybody else surrounding him. Often they're speaking about him. He is very quiet, so I think a lot of people just treat him like he's not in the room and they just talk about him. Um, it is sort of an interesting way to read about a character. You get other people's opinions of him and that helps form your view of him as a reader. I'm definitely getting Harry Potter vibes from this book and this main character because he's so young. Maybe that's the reason. Um, but he's in such an he is such an important character to the story. He's um, he has such an impact on the king and how the kingdom is changing, who lives and who dies. Um, I also get a bit of Little Nemo. If you remember that, um, I think it was early '90s, late '80s cartoon film the character he relies heavily on others to make decisions for him and push him but he ends up getting himself into trouble several times little nemo does that and our main character owen does that there's also a bit of game of thrones in this what with the king's story arc about how he acquired the throne and a bit about the noble families of the kingdom and where their loyalties lie um, and the fact that this in this world people worship a sacred fountain and the fact that um, the water that comes from the fountain and the power that it has. So that reminds me a lot of like the Greyjoys and the, the god that they worship is their drowned god. Um, I find that aspect fascinating, how fates can be determined by a trip over a deadly waterfall. That is how the kingdom will punish anybody who is a traitor. Um, they will are accused of being a traitor 
They'll put them into a boat, sail them off the end of the waterfall, and if they survive, then they're innocent. But most people die. Um, if you survive, if you're innocent, then you live, but you're then discovered to be fountain blessed, is what they refer to it as. Most of the people that go over the fountain, over the waterfall and survive are considered fountain blessed. This is a term that the kingdom uses, and it means that they have some sort of special power that this magical water has granted them. These blessed individuals have powers, a sort of psychic ability, and it varies from person to person. This layer of the story is not well developed in this book. They do reference it, and it's hard for me to sort of explain it because they don't really go into detail, probably because it's told from Owen's point of view when he's eight years old. Um, but we will undoubtedly learn more about this in the rest of the series, and I did add the sequel to my list. So I'm very excited to pick up the next book. I read the synopsis for that one, and it sounds like it, it jumps 90 years into the future, and Owen is actually in love with the girl, the little girl that he meets in here that he finds annoying, who becomes his best friend, and he's in love with her in the next book. I'm like, oh, that's so cute. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that was the first book that I read. I gave that, what did I even, I didn't even tell you what I rated that. Four out of five stars. I really enjoyed it. The next book that I read is the second book in the series. I mentioned it in January because I read the first book in January. The second book in the Shelby Nichols series, and it's called Fast Money. And I rated this four out of five stars. Again, it's I love the characters. Um, in this situation, in this book, um, Shelby finds an extra five million dollars in her bank account that Uncle Joey put there. <laughs> and she now she has to decide if she's gonna tell her husband that the money is there. Um, she thought she was done with Uncle Joey because Uncle Joey got her into trouble in the first book. Um, her husband thinks that her mind reading ability went away. If you didn't listen to my first review, maybe go back and listen to that now that I'm saying this. I explained more of the beginnings of the story in that review. Um, I'll link it down below as well. Um, Shelby can read minds. That's all you basically need to know and her life is just messed up because of it. Um, so now she, her husband thought that she lost her ability and she's like kind of debating whether or not she's going to tell him that it came back. He finds out anyway and he's pissed. Um, then the Mexican police tell her that Uncle Joey's been kidnapped and they're looking for a ransom. Um, as if this isn't enough, the police detective that she worked with needs her help to solve a case. Um, somebody that she called Dimples in the previous book. He's local police and he... He believes that she has premonitions, is how she described it. She gets feelings and he calls her up for help because she's just a really nice person. He's a nice person. Like, they're just helping each other out. Um, she becomes a witness to a murder. In her fight to stay alive, she finds that everybody who's after her wants her money. There's like four different groups of people that are after her in this whole book. Um, let me open up my review here. I love these characters. <laughs> that is the first line of the review. They're written to have true emotions, true motivations, and very memorable personalities. This book picks up right where the last one left off. Our main character, Shelby, is still able to read minds, but she hasn't told her husband yet. He knew she was able to read minds before, but thinks a recent accident has cured her of this. The ability really puts a strain on their relationship after he learns the truth. Um, this is the second time around that their relationship is strained because of it. Um, she is sort of defaulted to open, so she's always listening to everyone, and she has to work really hard to block off her thoughts. Um, she often forgets in the presence of her husband, and I personally don't like the conflict that that brings up. Um, not to be hating on their obviously love-filled relationship, because the author does make it very clear that they're very sweet on each other, they do love each other very much, um, but the dark part of my brain is, like, seriously hoping that they break up and she ends up with the Uncle Joey second-in-command, Ramos, <laughs> because there's no way that would work, like, in the book because, you know, she's happily married and has two kids, and obviously that would be terrible if something were to happen to her husband or if they were to break up, but, like, I still want her to end up with the, the like, Uncle Joey's right-hand man because he's really handsome and really sexy. And he takes a bullet for her in this book. Um, let's see here. Aside 
from The Strained Marriage. The characters are familiar and likable at this point. I love following this main character because she really just is an average wife and mother. She has no natural ability to lie or to defend herself and she is constantly getting herself into trouble because of the knowledge that her ability brings her. Although I can say this book had a lot going on in terms of plot lines and characters. I think there were four different people after her in the course of the book, all different motivations, all different identities. And to introduce them all, then wrap them up in the course of an eight hour narration, because um, I did read the audiobook, um, it was a bit much. It reminds me a lot of the Charlie Davidson series by Dorinda Jones. Um, you get so focused on one or two layers of the story that you completely forget what's happening in the other layers. There's just too much going on in this particular book. If the book had been more focused, it would have been a five star from me for sure. I do love this series and we'll be continuing on very soon. My last book that I read for this little section of the video is Daughter of Smoke and Bone, written by Lainey Taylor. This is the first book in the Daughter of Smoke and Bone series. And it takes place in an interesting world. Um, I'll read you the synopsis. I gave this three out of five stars. So it wasn't fabulous in my opinion. For the synopsis, um, around the world, black handprints are appearing on doorways, scorched there by winged strangers who have crept through a slit in the sky. In a dark and dusty shop, a devil's supply of human teeth grows dangerously low. And in the tangled lanes of Prague, a young art student is about to be caught up in a brutal otherworldly war. Meet Carew. She fills her sketchbooks with monsters that may or may not be real. She's prone to disappearing on mysterious errands. And she speaks many languages, not all of them human. And her bright blue hair actually grows out of her head that color. Who is she? That is the question that haunts her, and she's about to find out. When beautiful, haunted Akiva fixes fiery eyes on her in an alley in Marrakesh, the result is blood and starlight, secrets unveiled, and a star-crossed love whose roots drink deep of a violent past. But will Carew live to regret learning the truth about herself? So this was a truly unique setup for a story. I don't think I've ever read anything quite like this. Um, I did marathon it <laughs> for... I believe about 10 hours in one day. I wanted to finish it and I stayed up until about one in the morning reading it. Um, in terms of my review, I'm gonna give you my thoughts on this that I typed up because I feel like it sort of wraps up my thoughts. Um, I really enjoyed the beginning of this story. It's set in a realistic sort of human world with sarcastic and loyal characters and an academic and historic setting. I really like that part of the book. It reminds me a lot of the Discovery of Witches series, which is one that I might do a review on at some point because I really did enjoy that. I love the academic part of that story. It felt very familiar and more intellectual, <laughs> more thought provoking than some of the other books that I'd read in the past. And that interests me for some reason. Although not so much in the book that I'm reading currently, <laughs> but I'll talk about that in a later review. Um, I, ironically, I actually got a bit bored when the story started flipping through flashbacks of the main character's life. So the first part of the book takes place in, you know, the regular world. You know, she has some sort of supernatural tendencies and inclinations, but her friends and her teachers and her students don't really know much about that. Um, so it's mostly normal <laughs> to begin with, and I like that part of the book. And I actually got a bit bored when we started going to flashbacks and the world started to get more supernatural, more weird, which is weird because I normally like that kind of twist in a story. I'm not really sure I can explain why I didn't like it that much or why I got bored, but I'm going to try my best. Um, it's a world where angels, these winged creatures, I'm assuming they're angels, everybody calls them angels, um, they're at war with these demon-like creatures called chimeras. And I don't even know if I spelled it right because I was reading the audiobook and I wasn't seeing how it was spelled. <laughs> it's in my review, I don't know if I spelled it right. This is not something that I'm super familiar with. You'd think I'd be on the edge of my seat, you know, interested. By the way, I'm reading off my laptop. <laughs> That's why I keep looking down this way. 
I think part of the reason I was not captivated is because I was not really a fan of the way that the tone of writing changed when the love story launched. So this happens just before the flashbacks start and suddenly there are entire passages that read like poetry. They're very flowery and they're totally in contrast to everything that we've read up until that point. I'm all for good romance, but the beginning of the book seemed to be setting up the character in like an action adventure job-based storyline where the focus would be on her job and the weird things that she has to do for her job. All of a sudden she meets this guy and she totally loses her tough edge. Like she was carrying around knives before and she was, you know, collecting teeth from vendors that she's got to go visit. And there were some truly powerful images and emotions in certain scenes and I think overall the book is fine. Um, I love the climax of the book and the revelations that you could take a guess were coming. I mean, some of them were predictable, some of them weren't. I think at the point, um, I think at the point of the climax of the book, I was finally hooked and seriously interested in the characters. Um, right at the end, go figure. The climax happens like maybe 30 minutes before the book is over. <laughs> Um, it does not end in an uplifting way, but on a sort of cliffhanger with the love story at a crossroads. Um, I know this is a trilogy series and I may continue on at some point, just not immediately. So I was not like head over heels in love with this book. Um, I know a lot of people rave about it. They love it. But again, I was more interested in the action adventure part at the beginning of the book. And then it got all flowery and romantic and flashbacks with tragedy and I'm just like oh, can we go back to the adventure I prefer that maybe that's just my personal preference if I had read this at a different time I might like it more maybe that's just what I'm in the mood for right now I can't really say uh, but again I did rate that three out of five stars and I did put I think I put the second book in my wish list I'm not sure but I'm not planning on picking it up immediately um so that is it for these three books. I will see you in the next clip and you'll find out what I've read next. <laughs> I'm probably going to be like changing outfits and changing settings, but um, this is, like I said, this is probably the format that's going to work best for me. So I'll be reviewing books and little clips. So here's the next books. I finished another book. <laughs> So I'm going to do a quick review. I just finished today and I typed up my review right after finishing it on my lunch hour. Just so it's fresh in my mind and I thought, you know what, I think with my previous clip I did three books in a row. I'm just going to record this now right after reading it <laughs> the same day that I finished it while the ideas are fresh in my mind because this book had uh, gave me a lot of thoughts in my head. <laughs> Um, this book is The First Fifteen Lives of Harry August, and it was written by Claire North. I rated it three out of five stars, so not fabulous, not horrible. I'm going to read you the review that I typed up because I take pride in my work as a reader and a writer. Sorry, I have my scarf on still because I'm cold. It's cold outside. <laughs> I just got back from working overtime and... I think it's negative degrees right now. It was negative eight this morning. My car said it was negative six on the way home, <laughs> but I don't trust my car. She's silly. Okay, this book review, I'm gonna read you what I wrote and I did describe what's in the book, so hopefully that helps. Our main character, Harry, discovers that he is reborn after death. The same date of his first birth, but as he ages, he recalls all of his memories from his past life. When he dies in that second life, he goes back to his birth and starts over in that year again, um, now slowly remembering both of his past lives. So that's where the title of the book comes from, The First 15 Lives of Harry. Um, he discovers a club of people all with the same condition as him. Most are devoted to maintaining the current balance, but there are some who want to manipulate the knowledge for their own purposes. So say a person is born in 1920 and dies in 1990. The person, this person, after their memories come back and they're refocused, could bring knowledge from the year 1990 into the early 1920s. 
This would advance the knowledge base of their community and, by extension, the world. And this does happen in a few of the lifetimes that are described in this book. Not our main characters, but somebody else's. Um, there is not one plot line for this book, but the main conflict is between Harry and another man, Vincent, who is convinced that advancing the knowledge and technology will lead to a breakthrough in his own personal understanding of everything. All that was, is, and should be, I think is how he describes it. We follow Harry as he realizes the corruption of Vincent and how Harry plans to solve the problem. Um, the finale of the book leaves me feeling very conflicted. I won't say what happens um, because I feel like it is something that needs to be experienced if you can actually wade through this very complex book. Um, I do feel a bit sorry for Vincent, even though he is made out to be the antagonist. Um, he is a very morally conflicted character. He does things that are um, very determined, very single-minded, can be seen as evil when he's provoked. Um, but he does have a soft spot for the main character, Harry. They were friends. They worked together at one point, And his, the friendship, you can feel that's real. And so you're conflicted about how you feel about him and how he ends up. Um, this book is very confusing at times. It's super intellectual, philosophical, religious, and there are very in-depth discussions about morality and ethics. So if you think about it, the people going from the future, they die and they are transported back to the past where, when they were born. They can bring knowledge with them. They know everything that's going to happen and it's the debate of whether or not they share their knowledge or they keep it to themselves. That's discussed in detail quite a bit. Um, it took some getting used to reading this book. Also, the author describes sickness, torture, and death in several different gruesome ways because our cast of characters seems to find it interesting trying to almost experiment with death because for them it's not the end of their existence. So they can just do whatever they want. The book was hard to follow at times. The reader often has no clue of date, time period, Anything like that, we are constantly living this one character's life over and over again, not always knowing which life he's talking about, which one he's on, um, how old he is, what the year is. Um, so I think he was born in 1919, and he lives at least one of his lives to see the, trade the World Trade Center's fall in 2001. So he does live for quite a long time, but when he passes away, he is transported back to 1919. Um, the deep, uh, the, let's see, where did I leave off here? I enjoyed the idea that these characters can choose to live a different life each time around. So they can study something different in school. They can live somewhere else in the world. They can marry a different person. Um, that's all very thought provoking. It got, it gets you thinking about the, the deep things that people think about. The deep discussions that go into morality and ethics, those ended up being a bit boring for me. I enjoyed more of the contrasting character emotions, like when an adult dies and he have to be reborn as a child, because that's the only way you can get born. I think by age three or so, they've regained all their consciousness and their memories, but they're forced to live through childhood again because of their age and limitations like money and mobility. So some of the characters complain about having to go through potty training and puberty again. <laughs> Just think about that happening, you know, over and over and over again for our main character 15 times you have to go through puberty. Um, there are many, many interesting ideas presented in this book, but it is a bit deep for a fun read. This isn't something that you really just read for the fun of it. I probably won't read it again anytime soon, but then again, it is probably going to stay with me for a while. I'm probably going to keep thinking about different ideas. <laughs> Very thought-provoking. Um, that's my review for The First 15 Lives of Harry August. See you in the next one. Hi, it's Carrie, and I'm back with another clip, another book that I finished. Um, I just finished reading the last 15, or the first 15 lives yesterday, and I've already finished another book today. <laughs> so I'm just like flying through these, and I'm really glad that I thought of doing individual clips. Sorry, I'm shaking the camera. Individual clips of videos, because this is helping me remember exactly what I wanted to say. So I think we're on book number five now. I've read Dark Lover. 
by J.R. Ward. And this is the first book in the Black Dagger Brotherhood series. And this is also the first book to gain five stars from me this year. And it's not because of plot. It's not because this was a fantastically written story. It's because I love the characters so much. And I'm like, I'm literally like anxious to get my hands on the second book because I really want to find out what happens. And while I was typing up my Goodreads review, I looked up on Wikipedia because I could not think of this one character's name and I still can't think of his name and I didn't have it listed. And I found out that there are actually 19 books in the series that includes spin-offs and books that take place in the same world but don't necessarily have the same characters. I'm super excited! But okay, I'm gonna go ahead and read you the review that I just typed up because I feel like my words come out better when I'm able to print them out. Look at them, rework them, and then that's it. I'm not so great at the speaking, you know, what comes out of my mouth first thing. It's not always edited properly. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and read you my review. And first thing I said was when I came out here to type up my review, I noticed that the average review for this book out here is 4.21 stars. I'm like, oh, everybody else loves this book too. So I scrolled down and started reading reviews. And there are some really negative reviews out here. And I just, I don't see it at all why the review was that negative. Um, I'll just, I'll go through this and I'll give you my thoughts. Um, the first thing I wrote was, I'm really glad that I didn't read others' reviews before getting to this book in my own time. I was debating back and forth whether or not I wanted to give it four or five stars and I ended up going with the five. Maybe it's just the heat of the moment, um, the aftermath of the book, but I am in love with these characters. Not necessarily individual characters, but the group as a whole. It all works for me. Um, the Brotherhood is a seriously hot group of vampire men who protect their leader. His name is Rath. He's our main man in this book. And I don't know if I spelled the names correctly, incorrectly. In some of the reviews, they're spelled with really odd spellings. But it's basically this, the, um, some of them are like seven deadly sins. You'll, you'll hear that later on in the names, but I just spelled them like they're actually spelled in like regular English words. So Rath... W-R-A-T-H. He's our main man in this book. Um, the Brotherhood follow him, they protect him, and they also defend the vampire species as a whole. Although they do spend this entire book in their own city, surrounding their lord. So we don't really get a grasp on the whole vampire world as a whole. Um, tiny spoilers. They can eat garlic, and they can touch silver, but they do have a serious aversion to sun. Um, think total incineration. Um, they do not drink human blood for nutrition, only the blood of other vampires of a person of the opposite sex as them. They drink that blood to survive. They are able to drink human blood, but it doesn't have the same lasting effects. And in this world, vampires are born, not made. So there will be no overly dramatic changing of the human love interest into a vampire. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the deviations from traditional vampire characteristics in this book. I like what the author did. In this world, Wrath is the only pure, but pure blood vampire left alive, meaning he has not a drop of human blood in him. All others have ancestors who bred with humans. The closer to pure, the more nutritious and clean the blood is to other vampires. One of his brothers, Darius, approaches Wrath to convince him to help his half-daughter, Beth, um, his half-human daughter, excuse me, Beth, through her inevitable change into a vampire. She will turn around her 25th birthday because she does have enough of her dad's blood in her, uh, but she might not survive the change because of her human half. That's explained better in the book, but I hope I did that justice. Um, Darius has never met his daughter as he wanted to protect her, uh, from the vampire community, but he's actually murdered by a car bomb before he ever introduces himself or tells her that she will soon transition. Wrath tries to approach her first by breaking into her house in the middle of the night like a burglar. He has to wipe her memory so she's not traumatized. Um, then he comes back the next night and has sex with her and gives her her first orgasms ever. That was mentioned several times. Just like, really? 
Um, because the two, they have sex because they're just overcome by their extreme physical attraction to each other. If we could just ignore the insta-love for the rest of this book, it'll go pretty smoothly. <laughs> so, uh, basically, Wrath and Beth have a super strong physical attraction that bonds them together and turns into love. Which is not ideal. It's not an ideal way for a reader to be introduced to characters, but I'm... I'm over it. I accept it. Let's just uh, suspend a disbelief for this book. Um, there are side characters that really hold their own in this book, like the police detective, Butch, who has always sort of had a crush on Beth, and he finds Wrath shady. For the most part, for the most of the first part of the book, he thinks he's a drug dealer, and that she's an addict and needs him because of that. Um, then he meets the Brotherhood the one night, stands up to them, and he's sort of accepted into the group as, like, an honorary vampire, <laughs> even though he's still a human. Um, he finds himself attracted to Marissa, who is a beautiful vampire woman who used to be tied emotionally to Wrath. Um, she was the woman that he would feed off of, but he never touched her in a romantic way, and she always felt very shunted to the side, very unworthy, and it sort of it made her feel very repressed and not beautiful, not wanted. And I like her character and how that develops. But anyway, um, Butch, the cop, is attracted to Marissa. And their relationship that develops is just adorable. <laughs> um, then you have the psycho vampire killer, Mr. X, and his little army of recruits. It starts out as like a self-defense dojo or something like that. I think that's... A self-defense, that's a sensei. Sensei is the word, the title that they give him. And he trains them, he's basically training them to be vampire killers. Uh, Mr. X is our main antagonist. He sold his soul to his deity, that's called the Omega, to be granted super long life and special powers that are equivalent to those of a vampire, like speed and strength. Um, he is basically a supercharged vampire hunter with a serious vendetta. Um, I'm not super impressed with his final showing, um, taking on Wrath and Beth in the final, you know, couple final scenes. Um, that, that particular scene in the barn sort of flopped for me. Um, but it sounds like he'll get a second chance to impress me. His recruit, um, the one who's, I cannot think of his name. Um, it's somebody that was brought into the inner circle of the Omega and transformed into this super powerful vampire hunter. And I can't think of his name, but it's some 18 year old kid that tried to rape Beth at the beginning of the book. <laughs> so he, and he doesn't make it. He's not going to be making uh, an appearance in any future books, which is good. Tiny spoiler there. I didn't think anybody was really rooting for him to survive anyway. Uh, probably my favorite characters that I just cannot wait to read more about are the brothers themselves. Yes, they are a bit cookie cutter in the first book in terms of how they're described because they're basically all the same. Um, they're massive and intimidating with tattoos and scars and most of them have really fabulous hair. Um, one of, only one of the remaining five of them because Darius is killed um, and there are seven of them total. One of the remaining five has a love interest. This is Torment. Um, he's a bit of a sweetheart. He's expecting a baby with his wife, and also he's Wrath's right-hand man. They do have odd names, by the way, so if, you, if you're thinking you misheard me there, no, his name is actually Torment. But I'm pretty sure the author spelled it with an H, but I'm listening to the audiobook, so I don't know how he spelled it. I'm just spelling it my way! Um, the others are kind of free-floating, and they're romantically available, and some of them are rather promiscuous. Um, there's a character named Rage. Rage is one of the brothers. He hulks out whenever he gets mad enough, and he will not be stopped. He has to be talked down carefully out of his anger so that he doesn't rip off the head of anybody who touches him. Um, there's another character named Vicious. He's got tattoos all over him, um, all over his hands, and it sounds like he can incinerate just with touch. So he's dangerous. Obviously, they're all dangerous. Um, it sounds like he's also the smartest of the bunch, and he forms a friendship with the cop, Butch, over baseball, of all things. Um, there are the twins, Fury and Zadist. Um, there's not much that I remember being described about Fury in the book, other than he shot off his own leg to save his brother, and he's got a prosthetic leg. 
Um, maybe more was mentioned, but I just I don't remember much about Fury. I'm hoping when we get to his story, then I'll remember more of it. Um, Zadist, his brother, goes by Z, and he gets way more pages for his story, as he was actually tortured and brutalized very early on in life. He has no sympathy for humans, vampires, anyone. He hates everyone and everything, and he's always in a foul mood. He doesn't say much. He's very intimidating, just sitting there. He sort of emanates hate. Um, although in a stunning scene, he reveals that he actually has an amazing singing voice. Um, that sounds odd, but it was beautiful to read, and it didn't feel odd while reading it. I cannot wait for the book devoted to him. I really hope there is one. Honestly, the story arc as a whole was a bit lame, but I am a character-driven reader. I have learned that by reading this book, <laughs> and this author has just done it for me. He's created this entirely ca like beautiful cast of characters, and I am really excited to see what happens with each of them, so I don't really care if the story sucks or not. <laughs> Um, I'm just itching to grab the second book now and find out what happens when Rage finds his girl. So I'm so happy. <laughs> so if you want just a good, um, I, I don't even know if I would call it a romance because it's more action and character driven than anything. They do have sex, the main characters do, Beth and Rath do, but it's not a main focus of the book. They have sex a few times and it can get dirty, but that, like I said, that's not the main focus, so it's not a big part of the book. So yeah, if you would like just a good, I don't want to say trashy because that's not a good word, but it's just a very sort of um, guilty pleasure would be a better way of putting it. <laughs> if you want a good guilty pleasure book, I would pick up books in the Black Dagger Brotherhood series because I am very excited to read the next one. <laughs> Hello. I am back to tell you more of the books that I read. I'm filming this on my laptop because I am thinking it's going to be a little bit longer of a clip. So it takes up a lot of space on my phone and I hate having to remove audiobooks from my phone to make space for a video. So I'd just rather not do that. <laughs> if it's like just one or two books that I'm talking about then it would be fine, but I'm going to talk about like six books. <laughs> Maybe not in so much detail though. I think the last one that I did was for Dark Lover, which is the first book in the Black Dagger Brotherhood series. And I can tell you right now, I fell down that rabbit hole. <laughs> I mean, not entirely. I didn't, you know, do the entire series, but I read the first five books all in a row. So second book is called Lover Eternal. Third book is called Lover Awakened. Fourth book is called Lover Revealed. And fifth book is called Lover Unbound. And I'm not going to go into super detail about what each of them were about, um, just because little things are spoiled and it's more enjoyable, I think, to get with the first book. I did a more thorough uh, review of the first book, so if you want to go back and uh, watch that clip, you already watched that clip. What am I talking about? Um, basically it follows the different men in the Brotherhood, some of the side characters, and it's just building each book, book to book to book, building more characters, more relationships. The second book in the series follows, uh, Rage who is one of the brothers, he falls in love with a woman named Mary. Um, I'm looking at my phone, my Goodreads page, so I'm getting the names right. That would be embarrassing if I got the names wrong. Mary, yes. So the second book follows Rage and his love interest, Mary. She is human and she is um, dying of cancer, I think. Um, the third book follows Zadist, who was probably, that was the book that I was most interested in reading, um, only because his character is so damaged, so troubled by what happened to him previously. He was kept as a blood slave for a hundred years, and he was, he had his innocence raped out of him. I think that was how it was worded in the book. Um, and it follows his love story with this woman named Bella, who is also a vampire. Um, the fourth book, Lover Revealed, follows Butch, who in the first book is a human cop. He's an ex-cop, and he sort of becomes an honorary brother. Um, follows his love story with Marissa, who is a sort of aristocratic vampire, um, and how those two get together. Fifth book follows Vicious, who is best friends with Butch. 
he's one of the brothers and he is also very troubled by his past um, he grew up in a war camp um, and we see some of his background and he follows his love story with the human doctor or human surgeon who saved him when he was dying of a gunshot wound so I mean little things happen in each of the books that I wish I could talk about but I'm not going to because they're just they're guilty pleasures I mean they're not it's not high literature it's not you know, super fantastic writing or stories. I mean, there's a lot of insta-love in this series, but I'm character-driven as a reader, so I just enjoy learning more about the characters and their different quirks. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Book number two, I gave five stars. Book number three, I gave five stars because I was really loving. The first three books are just fabulous for me. <laughs> uh, book number four, Butch's book, I didn't like as much. I gave it four out of five stars because I wasn't really a big fan of the love, like the love connection. It just missed the mark for me. Same thing with book number five. I don't know if I was just getting like burnt out at the series at this point, but also four out of five stars. I just wasn't quite as thrilled about it as the first three books. Not to say it wasn't good because I still really enjoyed it. After book number five, I decided to take a break from this Black Tiger Brotherhood series. And I started reading this book called The Utterly Uninteresting and Unadventurous Tales of Fred the Vampire Accountant. Very long title. Um, it's the first book in the Fred the Vampire Accountant series written by Drew Hayes. And I gave this book four out of five stars. I really did enjoy it. It was very quirky. It's about five little short stories, all with the same characters, just pushed into one book. Our main character is a vampire. He was turned. We don't really know who turned him right away. Um, he goes, he just uh, wakes up one day. I don't even know if you could actually say wakes up, but he finds himself dead and doesn't know what to do because he realizes he's a vampire and he just decides that the best thing for him to do is to just go about living the same life that he did. That's just an unlife as the accountant that he was. <laughs> And now he just works at night from home and he uses a courier to take messages back and forth during the day and he gets his blood from the butcher shop. And he sort of stumbles into trouble. He goes to his high school reunion, his 10 year high school reunion, and runs into a girl that he was friends with in high school. Turns out she is now an agent of a secret government agency, agency and she fights paranormal creatures. But like, dangerous paranormal creatures and he's kind of like bumbling he doesn't really realize that he should be hiding his powers a little bit better so she spots him like right off the bat like she knows she she knows that he's undead <laughs> and it, it's just funny their interaction she's like uh yeah so when did you die <laughs> and he's like what do you mean <laughs> she's like you weren't doing a very good job of hiding it i love the style of writing in this it was very quirky very funny um at one point he acquires a zombie assistant they're dealing with a necromancer, they're dealing with a were-pony, kind of like a werewolf, but he turns into a pony. <laughs> very quirky, very fun to read. Um, I was actually listening to this while I was in hospital. <laughs> so I don't know if you can see, I have a cut right there, and on my neck I've got a bit of a red mark. Yeah, I won't go into it, but I was in hospital for four nights, and that book just cheered me up because it was funny and fun. Um, the next book that I read, I actually have here, it is the book Darker, the book by E.L. James. It is the companion novel to Fifty Shades Darker, which most people have heard of. It's the second book of the trilogy. This is told from the perspective of Christian Grey, whereas the original books were told from Anna's perspective. And I gave this book a two out of five stars. I knew what I was getting into. I knew when I bought this that it was not going to be fantastic literature. Um, I knew the original story. I knew this was going to be just very cut and paste from the original. I did like Grey, which is the companion to Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, this one, for some reason, this one just rubbed me the wrong way. Let me open up my review because I think I did a good job of sort of explaining my thoughts about it. Um, I said, obviously, this is a companion novel. I knew what story I was getting into, but this book 
it's just they're so new little con excuse me there's so little new content from the original story um, there's very little expanding from the original and obviously you can't expand it because you can't change the story but I like the scenes where Christian and Anna are separated because we get a little bit more of Christian's inner dialogue when he's at work um, the, the scene where Layla appears in Anna's apartment the psych session that they have with Dr. Flynn um, and the helicopter crash and the showdown at the end of the book with Grace, um, his mom, and Elena, his ex-lover. Um, especially that last scene, those were my favorite parts of the book. Um, because for the most part, Anna and Christian are separated and we're getting more of Christian's side of things. Um, otherwise, the rest of the book is basically verbatim. Fifty Shades Darker. It's almost entirely the dialogue between the two, which, I mean, obviously it can't be changed. You can't change the original story. I get it. And even though it's told from Christian's perspective, we usually only get about four-letter words in his mind. Um, very little emotion and very choppy sentences. I, it was just like two words, and then you jump down another paragraph. Three words, and it's... Oh, it was choppy, very choppy, very blunt, very difficult for me to sort of get emotionally invested in it, like even though I already know what happens. Um, overall, I think the book was too similar to Fifty Shades Darker. I wanted less verbal dialogue, um, since I already know the original story. Um, I was hoping for more internal dialogue of Christian, trains of thought from our Dom. It took me forever to get through this book. I'm pretty sure I read this for about two months. <laughs> So that is my thoughts on that book. Um, the next book that I finished was Shel Silverstein, Where the Sidewalk Ends. And my roommate loaned me her paper copy of this while I was in hospital and I just finished it. Um, I gave it three out of five stars. You know, it is very nostalgic. It's more geared toward children. Um, it is cute, a bit quirky, sometimes a bit scary. Like I forgot some of the poems that were actually in this book. And in one of them, the narrator, who's, you know, the main voice of that particular poem, is eating a baby. <laughs> or eats, or has eaten a baby, and everybody's questioning, who ate the baby? <laughs> Someone ate the baby. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> oh my god, why did I not remember that this was in here? It's not as great as I remember it being, but maybe that's just because I reread it as an adult, and it's more geared toward children who wouldn't be shocked by something like somebody eating a baby. Um, so that was my thoughts on that. Overall, it, I mean, it is a good book. Like I said, it's very nostalgic. I used to read it when I was in, like, um, summer camp or, you know, school, middle school, that sort of thing. That's kind of what I associate it with. So rereading it as an adult was interesting. Very quick read, obviously. All right, those are the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven books that I read. <laughs> I'll keep you posted if I should read any more this month. I'm thinking I will. I'm partway through a book right now. The book is... To come on, go away. The book is about 26 hours long, I think. Listening to audiobooks is just my favorite way of doing this. I'm actually reading another Drew Hayes book, who wrote the Vampire Accountant book. Turns out this one was just next in my to-read list. No, actually, I lied. I skipped over A Darker Shade of Magic. I previously mentioned that I try to read the books in the order that I purchased them. But I skipped over A Darker Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab because it's quite popular on booktube and I'm thinking once I read that book I'm going to want to read all three of them in a row and I'm just not ready for that kind of commitment right now. So I jumped into reading a different book. This is also part of a series but it's not one that I've heard of so I don't know if I'm going to get super invested in it. Um, yeah, I've got about 18, almost 19 hours of that left so I may or may not finish it in February. <laughs> Probably will. I usually listen to books all day long while I'm working, so I don't foresee it being an issue. Hey YouTube, it's Carrie, and I'm back with the final part of my book reading wrap-up for February. I've read three additional books since the last clip, and today is March 2nd, and I only have 12 minutes left of space on my phone, so I'm going to try to be quick about this. First book that I read this last part of the month is called Choice Not Chance. It's a novel based on a true story of one woman's survival of domestic violence. It's written by Sue Potter, which is a pseudonym, and I gave it four out of five stars. And I actually know the author personally. 
Um, I have met her several times. I see her several times a year. We go to different events and stuff. Her and her husband, her current husband, are friends with my parents. Um, so I don't know if that like affected my view on this book in any way. Um, it is an imperfect writing style. You know, there are grammatical errors, there are run-on sentences. Um, there's a lot of emotion in this story because it is about domestic violence. It's often very heartbreaking and it's like very blunt delivery because it is a shorter book. There's a lot of there's a lot of it packed into like a short number of pages. Um, the only thing that kept me from giving it five stars is I just I have a hard time getting into the frame of mind of somebody who is in an abusive relationship, but they love the person and somehow that makes it okay in their mind. I just, I can't wrap my head around that idea, that love or that this one person, the idea that you have in your mind of them would make any of this abuse okay. I just, I can't, I can't justify that in my mind. And so I had a hard time connecting with the, the main character. This is autobiographical. It is based on the author's experiences, which is really heartbreaking because I do know her. She is, I ended my review in here by saying she is happily married now. Because in the book, she does get married to the, abu the bu abuser, but she has since remarried. And her husband now is so sweet, so funny, so charming. Like, she's in a really great place right now, from what I can tell. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think you'll be able to get this book to read it unless you find it at, like, a Goodwill or a used bookstore or a library or something like that. It is out of print, and it's very hard to find. I got one of only two copies that were on Amazon. So, yeah, sorry about that. Um, the next book that I read is called Superpowered's Year One, written by Drew Hayes, and I gave it four out of five stars. It's kind of like a mashup between Harry Potter and, like, Divergent. Because um, it is, it takes place on a college campus, you know, a typical college. There are average students that go there, normal human students. But our story follows these five young adults. They're going off to college for the first time. And in this world, there are people who have special abilities, special superpowers. Um, those who can control those powers are called supers. And those who are unable to control the powers that they were born with, they're called powers. Um, and they are looked down upon. Those, the powers are considered like second-class citizens. Um, but the five students that we follow, they all began their lives as powers. They're not able to control the abilities that they have. Various, a wide range of abilities. From anything from creating things to uh, manipulating things, manipulating their own bodies. Like, a whole bunch of different things. But these five students were given some sort of experimental drug that suddenly helps them control their powers. And they're attending school to take part in this hero certification program. So all of the supers, up until this point, only supers have been allowed into the program. They're training to become heroes. So I think it's really cool because it's an academic setting. Like they're actually taking classes and they're training. But it's kind of like divergent in that they're competing against each other for a rank in the class. So there's different scenes. Um, they take place in, or they take part in a laser tag game you know, up, up the level, obviously, it's, you know, they're using their powers against each other to try to win the game. Um, at one point, they're stuck on a mountain, and they have to climb to the top of the mountain, these five people. Um, and it's, it's just, it, you learn their characters, you learn, like, how they're connected to each other. It is a very long book. I read the audiobook, and it's over 26 hours long, which I, I own books that are longer than that. But for some reason, this one just kind of dragged on but not in a negative way like I still enjoyed reading it um but it did it it went on a long time it's a very long book and I'm a very character driven reader so for me it was okay because I liked learning about the characters my favorite character is actually one kind of surprising like um he's not the typical character that you would root for um one of the five his name is Herschel and he's kind of a little bit of a dork um he likes role-playing games, LARPing, he likes Dungeons and Dragons, and, you know, he has this little group of friends, and they're generally outcasts in his community. They're considered outcasts. That's how he defines himself. Um, his power that he has is he turns into this 
badass horn dog named Roy. <laughs> and Roy is actually my favorite character because when Roy comes out, he's actually his own separate person with his own background. And like they, they share a mom and they share all these family memories, but they've never actually met. Herschel and Roy have never actually met each other face to face. They can't communicate with each other in real time because they're sharing one not, not even one body, because Herschel is a bit shorter, a bit pudgier, he's more out of shape. He takes care of all the mental abilities of the duo. Roy takes care of all the physical abilities. He is the strength and the speed and, like, the power of the duo. Whereas Herschel is more of, like, the heart and soul and um, the brains of the operation. Their dynamic is so interesting, and I don't... It was weird, because... At, for a while, I didn't like Roy, but as you learn bits about his history, like when he first came out of Herschel, and, you know, he's looking at Herschel's mom and going, I guess you're my mom too, and, oh, it's so weird. <laughs> I had such, like, tugs at the heartstrings for the bits of the story that we get of Roy. He's not a major part of the book. He's not one of the, I don't, he's not even considered one of the five, because Herschel's one of the five. He's almost like a little side character, but he's still my favorite. <laughs> But yeah, this is the first book in the series. Um, I think they mentioned several times that there's four years of school for them. But I only saw three books out on Audible. I put the second one in my wish list, but I haven't bought it yet. Um, I probably will not get to that right away because that one is also very long. And I don't know, I just needed something else shorter to come right after that. So the next book that I read is called Collide. And it's by Riley Hart. And it is a dirty romance between two men. <laughs> and I gave us four out of five stars. I did really like it. I mean, I I knew what I was getting into. You know what a dirty romance, what to expect out of it. It's not grand literature. It's not these huge sweeping storylines, story character arcs and development. Not really. Depends on how long the book is. Um, for this one, it's two men. They have been, they were best friends when they were kids. They've been separated for 17 years. They separated very suddenly, you know, one got packed up and moved away by his mom. And then it's just their friendship ended. They didn't keep in contact. They were kept apart. We ended up finding that out. But after they separate, the one man, Noah, realizes that he has these feelings for men. Noah realizes he's gay. And Cooper is the one who stayed in town he has always liked women. And now Noah comes back into his life and suddenly he's feeling like he has his best friend back and he's feeling all these strong emotions toward his friend. And I, it was a bit weird at the beginning of the book. How did I describe it in my review? Um, the book started off a bit slow and it was sort of unbelievable forced dialogue and odd situations to try to get these two back in the same sort of town and in the same situation, like... Cooper has a house in town because he's lived there. He's a firefighter in the town. And Noah moves back to town, and it was kind of forced getting them to live in the same house. Like, oh, I was going to rent the room anyway. Like, that bit of it was a bit strained and weird. It didn't feel quite natural how that happened. But I got over that pretty quickly. Um, Cooper starts questioning, like, everything about himself and when that happened, like, the emotions, the internal dialogue back and forth, then I was hooked. I'm a character-driven reader, as I think I said earlier. So I really liked when we get more of a character's inner dialogue and what their thought process is. And I feel like this book really did that well. And whew! <laughs> um, the characters are very charming, and they can also dirty talk pretty well. This book does contain very sexually explicit scenes, several of them. And they're very hot. Like, I was listening to this while I was working, and I'm just sitting there just, like, blushing, growing warmer. I'm like, Jesus, what a time. If my headphones were to fail right now, and all of a sudden, you know, blasting this scene out for everybody around me to hear. Oh, my God. Um, the only negative I had about this book in here is that we don't get much in-depth insight into their careers. Like I said, Cooper's a firefighter, and I thought it'd be really interesting to see, like, him responding to uh, an issue. Instead, we get little, like, snippets of, oh, yeah, I just got back from this fire, and he's in the shower washing the soot off of himself. 
We don't really get to see him in action. You could tell there wasn't a whole lot of research done into that particular career. And Noah, the man who moves back to town, he he says that he builds wooden furniture with his hands. And he misses it. He mentions that several times during the book, but we don't ever see him working on projects. I think we, we see the point where he gets his workshop, his workspace now, and he's going to start building things again, but we never actually see him working on stuff. That was the only thing I thought was a little weird. Like, we don't really see their careers. It's The book is more very centrally focused on their relationship, which is fine. I mean, it was also still, still a good book. Still gave it four to five stars. So yeah, those are the books that I read in February. Let's count them, shall we? I don't think I had as many as in January because I did have a bit of a medical emergency in there. <laughs> Um, but I read, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the Black Dagger Brotherhood series, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 books in February. I am pretty proud of that. <laughs> all right, if you have any questions about the books, feel free to leave them down below. Um, otherwise, I'm thinking this format works really well for summing up the books that I read in a month. I hope you enjoyed it, and um, let me know maybe recommendations of books that you read in February. I love books, obviously, and I love Audible. Um, I think only one, no, I did read two paper books this month. Three, three paper books this month. I am very impressed with myself right now. Um, yeah, so um, I hope y'all having a great day, and I will talk to you in my next video. Bye.